Uh, and so from one uh, UK professor whose name start, her surname starts with a D to another, uh, we are going into our segment now where we're going to look at investing personalities. Uh, we, were, we were very lucky to have such an enthusiastic response, which allowed us to gather a really rich set of data uh, to really start understanding what drives investing behavior uh, in South Africa. And to understand this as Ned Group Investments, we sort of looked around and went, okay, who can we partner with so we can really do this robustly? And we chose Oxford Risk, which is led by Professor uh, Greg Davies, as our partner for this piece of research because they've done work globally really looking at what are these things uh, that, that are within ourselves. So Professor Dolan spoke about the role of there's the stuff outside that makes us, uh, that affects us and the stuff inside that affects us. And what's interesting about these specific traits uh, that we're going to talk about today is that they really help us to understand in the world of investing, what is that connection between what's happening in this outside investment world and our interiors. Uh, and they've, they've gone through this really robust process around the world of identifying what these things are. And what's, what's really exciting is they've also done work looking at the responsible and impact investing side and identifying similar traits. So we're very excited to have uh, Professor Davies with us and for the work we've been doing with him and his team uh, to bring you this today. And to start off with, uh, Professor Davies, if you could just give us a sense of the process you and your team have gone through in understanding what these key drivers are and then giving us a sense when you had a look at our South African sample, was there anything interesting or surprising that came out uh, around how South Africans are, are understanding, investing, and, and interpreting it in terms of personality traits. So if you could give us some context on these personality traits that you and your team have identified in your work around the world um, as they connect to investing, and also you know, what did you find when you had a look at the South African sample with us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think the, the, the first thing to say is that uh, the reason we do this is because getting someone good investment outcomes, it is not enough just to hand them a technically correct portfolio and go, here's the right thing for you to invest in. Because in order for people to, to withstand the journey, they have to be comfortable enough to get into that portfolio in the first place. And they have to be comfortable enough to stick with it as the markets go up and down and we have pandemics, et cetera, et cetera. So what we have been trying to do, and we've been building this over many, many years now, is to be able to measure aspects of people's financial personality that are about their emotional comfort with their portfolio and emotional comfort with the investment journey. So we use a, you know, many, many large scale surveys. We've done it all around the world, lots of statistics and psychometric you know, techniques, et cetera. But what we are effectively doing is using a set of questions to try and zone in on and isolate people's scores on specific dimensions of, of personality that might influence how they uh, respond emotionally to the ups and downs of the investment journey. Um, now, when we looked at the, the, the South African survey that we've done, uh, gratifyingly, uh, very similar to what we see elsewhere in the world. I mean, these, are, these are fairly fundamental personality traits, so we really shouldn't expect to see you know, people in one part of the world exhibit a whole different set of dimensions than, than in the other. Um, so, you know, the, the, it's transportable. And so what we observe in the, in, the, in, the, in the South African context is a lot of things that we expected to observe. These, um, there are multiple dimensions to risk attitudes, for example. There are lots of different things going on there. We see that advisors are different as a group to clients, which perhaps wouldn't be surprising. Um, but we also see that there are identifiable client archetypes or personas. Um, although we can measure people on each one of these 12 different dimensions, there are certain common patterns that, 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 that individual people tend to cluster around. And that's very, very useful for understanding how to segment your clients and how to understand what to do with each client as an individual.
Thank you so much, Greg, for explaining those. I can already see we've got questions coming in. And for those of you who weren't aware, this is a segment where we will have Q&A. So please feel free to start. Uh, many of you have already started, but send those questions through and we will address them. Um, so as you've heard, these are the traits, these are the patterns. Uh, and, and what was really exciting for us is, you know, you go into this, you don't know how, if you, how much data you're going to get. We got a lot of data, we got a lot of groups. Um, and so as a result, we could do this analysis. And what was really exciting about the work with, with Greg's team is that we were able to find uh, these six archetypes or patterns uh, that, uh, that Greg has alluded to in terms of how they come together uh, and how these, these different attributes uh, often recur. And this is where you can really start drawing on these kind of these six personality types that we, we, we've found in our South African sample, which is so exciting. And um, Greg, if, if you could take us through uh, what, these, what these archetypes are and also what were some of the, the, except the interesting things that defined them um, and really yep. were the things that make you know, so different groups of South Africans a, a approach investing in very different ways. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're right. I mean, we, we have data, um, you know, in the survey, we've got data from around 3,000 people. So it's, you know, it's a rich, big sample size of whom 70% uh, were clients and 30% were advisors. And that gives us a very interesting uh, comparison. And we are measuring 12 different dimensions of personality here. So there's a lot of ways in which people can differ. But what is interesting when we go to the, the archetypes is People split apart from each other, um, yes, on, on all 12, and, and it's useful to be able to look at each individual as an individual. But some of these dimensions are overwhelmingly more important than others in, in breaking people apart. Um, Amy, just to check, I, I can't see what the audience is seeing slide-wise, so I don't know, are, you, are they seeing a slide at the moment? Yes, they can see the archetype slide with the, with the six okay. archetypes and the split between low and high composure. Brilliant, yeah, so I mean, that that is, the, the first and most fundamental thing is this composure split. And it's very interesting because the whole of finance theory tells me in order to give someone the right portfolio, I need to understand their risk tolerance, their long-term willingness to trade off risk in return. And that's pretty much stops there. Classical finance theory says that is the only aspect of your personality that we care about. But when we dig deeper, we find that my long-term willingness to trade off risk in return is by no means the whole story. And composure is over and over again, uh, a vital sort of second, uh, you know, second uh, uh, thing to, to consider. And effectively, composure is about someone's tendency to be emotionally engaged with the short term, with the here and now, with the present. And if we can identify people who are more likely to be a little bit more anxious or a little bit more emotionally engaged, it means we should do something different for those people. We can't just give them a portfolio. They need more handholding, they need more guidance. And so that first split is right down the middle of, of the population. There are people who are naturally more cool, calm and collected and are quite capable of, of keeping their eyes on the long-term goal. And there are other people who get emotionally distracted by what's happening in the market. And three of the groups fall on, on each side. So there are three class personality clusters that are higher composure and three personality clusters that are that are lower composure. And then this links to, to other things. I don't know if you can go on to the, the next slide. Um, the, let's just maybe look at the low composure groups first. So there are three of them. There, there are these, the, the stressed group, the sensitive group, and, and the skittish group. Now the skittish group is, is reasonably simple. They're, they're, they're kind of in the middle, but they tend to be lower composure and want a little bit more guidance th than everyone else. Um, but it's the other two groups that really stand out. So the, the stressed group, yes, they're lower composure, but they also score really low on, on two other dimensions that are super important. One is confidence. Not only are they low composure, but they dislike making financial decisions. They, they really, uh, um, you know, it makes them feel uncomfortable. And they also tend to be um, low in financial comfort. So this is the um, this is the stressed group. Low in, and low in financial comfort means effectively they're worried about their financial situation. They're worried about their financial future more than anyone else. And once we know these characteristics about this group, you can start serving them better. Not just saying here's a different portfolio for you, but here are the sorts of discussions we should be having. Here's the communication we should be having. Here, if I have a volatile week on the markets, is how I should approach you. And then we get on the other side, the, the sensitive group, also low composure, 
But the difference in, in them is they want advice. They have this high, high desire for guidance. These are people who become more emotionally comfortable if they feel that they can talk to an advisor, if they feel they can share the emotional burden of investing, of making decisions with someone else. And very interestingly, that group is, is the only one of the, um, of the low composure groups who are also interested in doing social good or particularly interested in doing social good. So they score high on this impact trade-off uh, dimension there, which is the degree to which people want to uh, express their social preferences, uh, environmental preferences, you know, uh, ESG preferences, alongside um, their, uh, their financial preferences. And then on the other side, the next slide, we have these other three groups who are completely different. Um, and, and again, there's sort of, there's one group that's a little bit in the middle there, uh, which are the settled group. They're, they're kind of your roughly in the middle of most dimensions, but tend towards higher composure and tend towards lower desire for guidance. And then we've got these two groups that really pop out. So the secluded group, we can think of these as the, you know, these are the, I'll do it myself. I'm self-sufficient, leave me alone. You can see their desire for guidance score there dropping way off the bottom of the screen. These are people who just, they do not get emotionally com emotional comfort from sharing the burden of decision-making with their advisor. They only feel comfortable with their decisions if they think I've made that decision myself. And a lot of entrepreneurs, for example, will fit into, into that group. Uh, and then the other group here that, that's interesting to look at is, um, so that was the secluded group. Uh, the other group is this um, secure group who uh, high composure, relatively low desire for guidance, um, but they, again, are the ones, the differentiating feature here is that impact trade-off. These are the ones that are secure in their financial situation, their financial comfort is relatively high, and they are willing to consider how do I start doing social good with, with my wealth. And so you can see here, we've, we've picked only five of these 12 dimensions, and already you get a very rich sense of how these six groups are different from each other, and that can have very real practical ramifications of what's the right portfolio, what are the right products to put in it, how do we communicate better with people? All of that um, can be advanced by these personality measures. 100%, thank you so much, Greg. That gives you a sense of the six that we've discovered and just uh, to settle some of the housekeeping concerns, we will be making all of this available to you. Uh, what uh, Greg alluded to earlier um, is that many of the results we found about advisors, we've been talking about clients so far or people who invest for themselves or th with an advisor. Uh, what we found with advisors was not particularly surprising, um, but it was in some ways quite challenging. And so on this slide, what you can see is really the split on the one side between clients as a whole uh, and financial planners in terms of the split between these six personalities. And then on the other side, you can see the advised clients, the clients who are going to advisors and matching them with the advisors. And the trends on both sides are quite similar. So the first thing, as you'd expect, in the more uh, you know, stressed out groups, the more sensitive groups, these low composure groups, you see a lot less financial planners. Fin financial planners tend to be more confident, they tend to be more composed, they're quite comfortable in the financial space, which is what you would expect. But the thing that makes it really interesting is if you start looking at some of these high composure groups, there are a lot more advisors and planners in these high composure groups than their clients are. And it's even more severe when you look at advised clients, suggesting that the type of people who go to advisors and the type of people who become advisors are quite different. Uh, and this, this can really, where you know, the rubber can hit the road in terms of how are these relationships within financial services managed. And so we're gonna, we're gonna create a hypothetical example so we can really bring to life how, uh, how you would look at this. So, so um, Professor Davies, if we were to look at, say, a very stylized example and say you had a really secure um, financial advisor on the one hand and they had you know, one of these, these sensitive clients coming to them um, and wanting advice, what are the, the, some of the things, uh, based on what we know now, that could potentially go wrong? And what are the things that one could do uh, to make that interaction really meet the need of the client and really uh, enhance their journey in alignment with who, who they are? Yeah, I, th I think that the overwhelming thing here is, as humans, we, we often tend to think that other people around us are more like us than in fact they are. And so this very big gap here 
if you've got that confident advisor, a lot of the clients they are seeing are going to be much less confident and much more co much less composed than they are. And this means that advisors are likely to underplay the need of that uh, uh, in that client for emotional comfort. They might think, actually, you know what, uh, it's a market blip, it's not a big deal. Why would this person be stressed by this or anxious? And they may be systematically underestimating the level of anxiety in the people sitting in front of them. And that means I think one of the one of the major benefits of having an advisor is is to be able to provide that emotional comfort. And if the advisor isn't aware of it because they're just a particularly cool, calm and collected individual, you're not going to get that rapport. You're not going to get that communication. So things we can do about that. I mean, one is using profiling tools like this, because if the advisor has in front of them on paper objective measures of who that client is, it makes it much easier for them to give that client the solution and the communication that's right for them because it's you know it's in black and white this person sitting in front of me is more anxious than i am there's also a danger here in in, in the products we in the portfolios you build because there's you know there's a tendency for all of us if i had 20 clients my 20 clients should all get the investment portfolio that's right for them for their financial needs and their personality needs but there's a danger because I, as an advisor, I'm confident. I come to it with my own opinions of what that, port what my, what my ideal portfolio would look like. And so, in a sense, very often those 20 clients sometimes get slight variations on Greg's ideal portfolio rather than the portfolio that's ideal for them. So the other thing I think you need to do is to make sure that the the systems you use to identify the right risk level for for clients, and the systems you use in order to choose the products that you put in that client's portfolio should be driven by a deep understanding of who that client is and, and their portfolio. Because otherwise, this co cool, confident, you know, composed uh, investor is going to think, well, of course, this person can have this highly volatile asset in their portfolio because it's really not that, that much of a problem. Um, the big issue with anxiety is that people who are low on composure tend to have shorter emotional time horizons than mm. people who are higher composure. And that means that a lot of stuff that the highly composed people will just gloss over from week to week. They won't notice it. Or if they do, it won't make them anxious. That is not the case for, for the anxious investor. So we really need to start matching portfolios to personalities, um, but also communication and, and optimal handholding, if you like, for personalities. Optimal handholding. I like that. It sounds very technical. Um, <laughs> So we've had quite a few questions come in. Um, I'm going to aggregate a few questions as I ask them because there's some common themes. So one of the first uh, ones I want to ask you, Professor Davies, which comes from Tabo, Karabo and Nomi, is it's kind of a variation on this nature, nurture kind of question to say, you know, when we see that someone has low composure, low confidence, um, is that something one should be trying to address or change directly? Is this something that's likely to change over their lifetimes? Or is it like you've been talking about more that we need to adapt um, the investment solution and investment journey uh, to, to the clients and to the individual who's going through it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's much more the latter over, over the time uh, horizons we're thinking about. So this is not to say that features of personality can't change, but after about the age of 20 on you know, any fairly fundamental personality trait, it tends to be relatively stable over time. So the better thing to do, rather than to try to change the person in front of you, um, you know, it's like, it's like getting married. You, you, get, you get married because you want to change this person, but you realize actually, no, you just have to adapt <laughs> to them. And, uh, you know, it's, just, I think, the similar way with, with clients here. Yes, personality will change, but it may change much more slowly than the markets do. Well, it certainly will change more slowly than the markets do. And if you want to give people a portfolio they can stick with, it's better to accept who they are and then figure out how to how to um, deliver to that rather than try to change who they are. That said, there are things we can put in place. I mean, if you know, just because someone's low composure doesn't mean they're going to be a nervous wreck. It just means that they have a tendency towards focusing on, on the present. So if you communicate with them differently all the way through the, the, the cycle, you can actually take a low composure person and they can be you know, perfectly level headed. It's about knowing in advance. 
Thank you for that. And then a, then a, a, a different but similar question that we had from um, Susan and Rafil where was just looking at what is this relation between these type of investing personality traits that are specific to investing and other ways that we talk about uh, personality. I mean, there's, there's Myers-Briggs and there's the Enneagram and then there's also, you know, the big fives model. You know, how does, do these characteristics of personality um, that are specific to investing interact with those? Is there a relationship? Uh, there is, um, particularly with the big five. So Myers-Briggs is, like is like the astrology of, of personality typing. Just throw it away. Um, but the big five is a very, very well-studied, uh, well-documented, uh, you know, it's, it's the most widely used personality typing by academic psychologists. And it's basically saying there are, there are fundamentally five stable dimensions that underpin um, who we are. And there are things like introversion and extroversion. Now, the tech tools and techniques that we use to, to get to these are the same as those that are used to arrive at the big five, and there are many correlations between them. So, for example, one of the big five dimensions of personality is neuroticism. It's someone's tendency towards being neurotic. And there's a subscale of that, which is the anxiety subscale. That, although we don't like to use the word anxiety, we prefer composure, that is very close to composure. So many of the things that we have here will map onto, um, map onto other personality measures like the big five. The difference being is the big five is trying to describe the person as a whole, you know, every aspect of their personality, whereas we're trying to zoom in here just on the more granular features that are particular to their financial decisions and their investing decisions. Excellent. And then one final question from Brenda. Um, you know, we've been talking about how we might need to accommodate for, you know, particularly low composure clients has been a bit of a theme in the South African work. And does this, does this mean we might risk um, meeting, a, you know, an individual's investment goals because we need to soften some of these things? How, how does that trade-off work between making sure we reach the goal um, and making it with the investment portfolio and, and how we take the person to that goal? Yeah, I think that is a super question because if you think here, what, what you've got is, particularly for low composure investors, there is a trade-off between chasing the financially right thing to do and making people comfortable. Now, one way of doing it, the traditional way of doing it, is you go ignore your, your ignore your composure, just do the right thing, and and you know stick with it and become Spock from from Star Trek. The other way is to go, oh, well, let's step as far away from the, from the right thing, financially right thing to do from, you know, let's, let's reduce your risk adjusted returns, let's reduce risk uh, in order to make you comfortable. Now, somewhere along that continuum is the right thing to do. And, and our feeling is that, yes, you can make people comfortable by dialing down risk, but you have these costs, the cost of not reaching your goals, uh, the cost of lowering your returns. And for the most part, what we should be striving to do is maybe not aim for like the perfect, technically technically perfect portfolio, aim for something slightly lower than that, but the most of the work should be done not by changing the risk level, but by changing communication and changing client mm. engagement. Because okay. I can do an awful lot more to make you comfortable by the way in which I present information to you and the way in which I build a relationship with you as an advisor than I can just by changing what I stuff into your, into your portfolio. So ideally, what we're striving for is kind of the best of both worlds. We don't want to sacrifice the goals. We don't want to sacrifice too much of the returns. We might, you know, take our foot a little bit off the pedal, but mostly we want to put our energy into, uh, into helping to educate and communicate and build the confidence rather than um, just go, oh, well, sit in cash for the next 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that does sound a bit dangerous. Um, and what would you say would be what your, what would be your number one thing if you are a, a high composure advisor dealing with a low composure client? What is the number one top thing you can do in your communication to really uh, be alongside that person along the way? What would be your top tip? Uh, stay out of the weeds. Um, you know, the thing that makes people anxious is if you are telling them about what the markets are doing minute by minute, and you're, and you're looking at their portfolio, you know, this tiny piece by this tiny piece. The overwhelming thing is if you can slow your communication down, focus everything on the long term, not the short term, and focus everything on the portfolio as a whole, people's total wealth, before you dig into any details, start high level and work down. And 
you're not hiding anything from people. They can still drill down if they want to. But if you start with a high level long term message, you're effectively setting the emotional frame for that conversation. And for low composure people, that can be extremely valuable. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Davies, for joining us today and for giving us those insights. They're just so valuable. Um, and the full report that we've done with Oxid Risk will be available to everyone who attends today. So you can get even more insights, um, which I hope you will find it as fun as we did uh, discovering all these things together. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So we've started very high today in terms of looking at happiness. Um, and broadly what makes people happy, what, pe what doesn't, how does that filter into our life, what does it mean about how we think about investing. Then we got more specific, looking at the kinds of traits that sit in that space between our broader context and our individual ways of reacting to that in this session now.